Good morning, saints. You know, I don't say that lightly because I know you don't always act saintly. And neither, and neither do I, right? I don't always act saintly. Matter of fact, I think I act saintly very little. <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that I am a saint of God. I am a saint because I am covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. And if you're a saint, it's the only reason you're a saint as well. And I am desiring that my, uh, my outward walk uh, begin more and more to match up with the reality of, of who and what I am as a follower of Jesus. Also, I just want to say to you this morning, before I say anything else, that God loves you. God loves you. Thanksgiving celebration, November the 19th, that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Each year we lay aside a Sunday prior to Thanksgiving Thursday to rejoice, to praise God, to worship Him for what He has done, to thank Him. Uh, we should be thanking Him every day, but that's a special time. This year we're also going to be recognizing on that day John Porter. John has been serving this church for many years and he has faithfully served the church, and he has done so many wonderful things. And he is retiring from the staff of the church to become a full-time missionary. And he'll be, after the first of the year, beginning to... He's already been accepted by a mission agency. He'll begin to research exactly where he's going to go and how he'll be serving. But we want to recognize him on that day and, uh, and, and honor him. And so on, on that day, we're going to have an open house from 2 to 4 in the fellowship hall. So we want to make sure that you mark the calendar and that you know about that and come and, uh, and let John know how much he is loved and appreciated and also wishing him well as the first of the year rolls around and he begins to make uh, those active steps uh, toward the mission field uh, in another country. He's been on mission all along. It's just he's changing locations from uh, the place he's doing that mission work from. Well, today we are um, we're closing out chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're finishing out the six workings, outworkings of faith that are part of our transformation from the image of our father in the flesh, Adam, to that of the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. If you'll remember last Sunday, if you were here, we worked our way through the first three. We looked at a new character, a new emotion, a new work ethic. Today, we're going to be looking at those last three, new speech, new relationship to the Holy Spirit, and a new world view. If you have your Bibles with you, first, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32 uh, you can also access that, access that on your smartphone or your tablet or uh, just look there on the screen if you want to see the exact same version uh, that I'm reading from. Uh, Paul finishes out this chapter saying, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with someone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and Slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Join me in prayer. So, Lord, in these few moments that we have to look into the Word, and to share the insights that you have provided, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit guard what is said so that it will be Accurate, loving, grace-filled, but nonetheless powerful for your purposes. I pray that you'll encourage us, convict us, change us, draw us to a closer walk with you. For that person who is here today who has yet to 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. May this be the day that their heart is opened and their spirit is made alive and they become part of your kingdom, part of your family. For those of us who have had that conversion experience in our life, who know you, may we be propelled and motivated toward new steps of growth today. In all that is done, may you be glorified, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I I just find it helpful to continually remind you about this letter to the church in Ephesus, about its division. Because if you don't keep that in mind, you can very quickly and easily begin to get some wrong ideas. So let's just reinforce again that chapters 1 through 3 focus on what? They focus on, tell me. Belief. They focus on belief. Revelation truth that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul about the work of Christ that is the foundation and power from which life transformation is possible. I say this to you with all assurance that it is accurate. Without a proper understanding and belief of what is revealed in the first three chapters of Ephesians, what is called for in the last three chapters is absolutely impossible for us to attain. Now, whereas chapters 1 through 3 are all about belief, chapters 4 through 6 are about behavior. What a life looks like that is impacted by the realities of the gospel which are laid out in verses in chapters 1 through 3. And it's imperative that we remember this. It's imperative to remember that, that what we heard last week and what we're going to hear today is not a, a, a call to pull yourself up, as I like to say, by your bootstraps. It is not a call to grit your teeth really hard and strain your abdominals and say, I'm going to find a way to make this happen. Rather, it is a, a call to simply, by faith, live out what Christ has done to live out what he has provided, and to do so in the power of the Spirit and the power of the gospel. With that said, I want to unpack these last three workings of faith. Adam spoke of it a couple of times, and here we come to it, a relationship, a new relationship to our speech. New speech, verse 29. We find that the gospel places us into a new relationship with our speech where it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. So what is corrupting talk, right? Paul employed the word sapros. It paints a very vivid picture. It is used for food that has become rotten. If you'll give me the next slide, please. What is more luscious, tempting, uh, life-giving than fresh food? I mean, fresh fruits, when you bite into them and they just, oh, it's just the flavors just roll over the tongue. And meats, especially when they're done just right. And everybody has an opinion about what just done right meat is all about, right? But nonetheless, I mean, it's so good. Nothing is more encouraging, but nothing is more disgusting. Nothing is more abhorrent than food that has gone bad. You know, the same can be said for what comes out of your mouth. Look at those pictures, would you? What comes out of your mouth, your speech... It can be fresh, it can be sweet, it can be encouraging, or it can be like decay. It can be bitter, and it can be damaging. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this, James chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. He said, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a, world, a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can, be, it can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. 
Our speech is so important. What are some examples of corrupting talk? Well, I put them there on your note guide. Off-color jokes, dirty stories. I was really discouraged to learn that one of our former presidents found it uh, appropriate in his mind to tell a dirty story to people that he meets before he gets his picture taken with them to try to, as he said, set them at ease. Once it came out public, it doesn't look too well on him, I don't think. But that certainly is corrupt talk, profanity. And I don't need to define that for you. I could, I've spoken lots of profanity in my day. I could give it to you, but you know what it is, don't you? Don't you? I thought you did. Vulgarity. And double entendre. If you don't know what that is, look it up when you go home. But you see it all the time on television. Now, now the truth is, is that 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 kind of, of speech is to be expected from those whose spirit remains dead unto God. Those who do not know Christ. Those who are not his followers. That is, that is the way of the world. Uh, that is to be expected because there is no spiritual life in them. There is no Holy Spirit dwelling in them that is convicting them and shaping them and guiding them. But, but such is not true of the child of God. Now, the, the child of God, according to the Bible, has been crucified with Christ and has been raised with him to new life. We have a new spirit that that is alive unto God, and we have a mind that is, that is to be renewed in the light of his revelation. So there really isn't an excuse for followers of Jesus to have corrupting talk, unless we're just not being cognizant of that reality. Where does corrupting talk come from? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, said, Whatever's in your heart determines what you say. Whatever's in your heart determines what you say. So if your speech is corrupting, it is because there is still a lot of corruption in the heart. And that's why following Paul's instruction that we find in Philippians 4, 8 is so important. Notice what he says. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Catch this truth point this morning. What you fill your mind with will fill your speech. What you fill your mind with will fill your speech. If you fill your mind with the negativity of the political arena that is out there on TV every single day spewing forth like a cesspool, then your conversation will be negative and critical and backbiting just like theirs is. If you fill your mind with the dirty stories and the dirty jokes, you'll find opportunity to repeat those because you think they're funny. If you fill your mind with the lust and the sex and the whatever else, then you're, that's where you're gonna, your mind's going to go. That's where your mouth's going to go. The heart, the inner person, the shaped by what the mind feeds on and what the what is in the heart Jesus said will come out in your speech so followers of Christ are to fill their minds with the good things of God why because followers of Christ their mouths are to be filled with blessing toward the world I found it interesting as I was listening to think it was um Yeah, it was when Brent was praying. And he also was exhorting us a little bit there, talking about those who are captive, loving their captive captors well, praying for them. You know, the world wouldn't think that way. They'd say hate them, resent them, 
uh, stab them in the back if you get half a chance. Of course, I'm sitting there thinking, well, that is the way the world would think, and that's the way my flesh would naturally think. But Jesus said, love your enemies. He said, do good to those who persecute you. We need to fill our minds with the good things of God so that our mouths become filled with the good things of God so that we can be a blessing even to those who might be considered our enemies. Catch these three points very quickly about our speech. Our words, according to Paul there, are to be edifying. What does that mean? It means they are to build up. They are to increase. They are to encourage. They are to make new, right? And I would just challenge you this week, seriously, I'm challenging you right now. I'm challenging you to take some time this week to examine your speech. I just want you to look at it yourself, and you don't have to report to me or anybody else. Just just, just look and see, is it helpful? Is it encouraging? Is it instructing others in the way of truth? Or does your speech go somewhere else? Number two, our words are to be appropriate. That means they are to fit the situation. You know, one of our problems, one of my problems, is that we think we have to say something about everything And when you live that way, when you think you have to say something about everything and you're always talking, then eventually it's just bound to determine you're going to say some things that are inappropriate. So let's consider some wisdom from Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken, that means carefully measured and and you're not running your yap all the time, but you speak when necessary. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in setting of silver. Proverbs 15, 23 says, To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. Let me give you my interpretation, my very broad, brushed interpretation of those. Sometimes it's just good to keep your mouth shut. Can I put it any plainer? Not every, listen. Not everything we think needs to be said. And not everything we think we might want to say is appropriate. Before putting your thoughts into someone's ears, because that's what happens when you open your mouth, before putting your thoughts in someone's ears, ask yourself, is this edifying? Does this fit the situation? And number three, our words are to be gracious. That means rooted in love. By all means, our words must be truthful, but raw truth can often be destructive. There is a way to speak truth so that it comes across like blunt force trauma. And there is a way to speak so that it gets the point across and the person is happy they have received it. When I wrote that, I immediately thought of this man right here, Mickey Dalrymple. Mickey Dalrymple, he was my pastor for a a number of years in Columbus, Mississippi when I was still in the Air Force. He's passed away now. But Mickey had a very graceful way about him. You look at him, he just looks like he's dripping with grace, doesn't he? I mean, that's, you know, just looks like, well, whatever. But you know, one of the things about old Mickey, he could hit you right between the eyes with powerful, life-altering truth, and it was so pleasant, you'd say, hit me with another one. You smashed me with the first one, go ahead and annihilate me again. It was just that way. I don't know how he did it. I don't know why. It was just a gift that he had. But I mean, he could, he could just strip you clean, and you'd say, can we do it again? He just had that way. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You know, most people will receive from us even hard truth when it comes in the beautiful package of grace. Verse 30 carries us into the fifth item 
that is new for us as followers of Jesus, and that is a new relationship to the Holy Spirit. The Scripture teaches us when a person comes to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God literally moves in to take up residence in their body. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian this morning, you have supernatural deity living directly in you. You're not supernatural deity, but you have one living in you. It is the Spirit of God. In fact, the Spirit of God, the Bible says, is given to us as a gift. To ensure that we can live the life that we are saved to live. And that really is our new relationship with the Holy Spirit. You see, we are called as followers of Jesus to be his hands and feet. And the Holy Spirit is the source of the power to ensure that that actually can be done. And so when you think about it from that perspective, it becomes very, very critical that we... Uh, do not choose to jeopardize the free flow of the Spirit's power by choosing to live according to the old nature. So Paul exhorts us, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This word grieve in that sentence, it means, here's what it means, it means to cause pain, to bring sorrow, to cause distress. Pain, sorrow, distress is what we force upon the Spirit of God when we choose to walk in the path of the old nature. Now I've got something here that I really want to drive home. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here for just a second to let you catch up and wake up and see Smell the flowers and get your breath. Listen, seriously, this is gold right here. When we choose as followers of Jesus to walk in the path of the old nature, God is not angered. He is pained. Not angered. Pain. Listen to me. When I lie, when I use corrupt language, when I steal, God isn't angry with me. Though most of us in this room think that. No, no. He's not angry. And why is he not angry? Because he's already poured out the full measure of his anger upon his son. He did not leave any in the tank to be poured out on you. He poured out his anger on Jesus. But when we sin, we grieve the Spirit. We cause him pain. It causes the spirit pain to see me living as a slave to sin when in reality I've been made a free man in Jesus. He's not angry, but he is hurt. He is filled with sorrow. He's filled with pain. And this is a lesson that the spirit has been teaching me lately. I've got to say that, that as I've begun to come to a greater understanding of this point, it has been revolutionizing my behavior. When I used to live under the false premise of God's anger over my sin, I seemed to have little victory over sin. But when I understood that Jesus bore the anger at the cross, that my misdeeds are now causing anguish to the Spirit. I began to see my sin in a different light and become more resolved to turn away from it as to walk toward it. It has revolutionized my life. I'm not looking at God as angry, but at my sins against Him as causing Him grief and pain. And it has changed how I now want to relate to the old nature. Charles Spurgeon, from way back when, wrote this. 
He says, for it is an inexpressibly delightful thought that he who rules heaven and earth and is the creator of all things and the infinite and ever-blessed God condescends to enter into such infinite relationships with his people that his divine mind may be affected by their actions. Truth point. When you realize how loved you are in Christ, it impacts the way you respond to the Father's loving call to holiness. When you realize how loved you are in Christ, it impacts the way you respond to the Father's loving call to holiness. Verses 31 and 32 close out the chapter. And I title this a new worldview. And I use the world, the name worldview here, the title worldview, because it's exactly what I see. I see here the worldview of the unbelieving mind and the believing mind. The unbelieving mind is represented by the six words that are there in these two verses. Let's identify and define them. The first word is bitterness. A brooding grudge-filled attitude. And that little italics word is the Greek equivalent. Wrath, wild rage, the passion of the moment, anger, long-term, deep-seated, smoldering resentment, clamor. Let me see if I can say that without my voice cracking. <laughs> A little of the magic sauce, clamor. <laughs> Public outbursts that reveals loss of control. Slander, ongoing defamation of others, and malice. On, uh, the evil that is the root of all vices. These six words define the natural way of the unbelieving mind when it comes to conflict. And conflict is our world. Is it not? Hello? Conflict between nations. Conflict between races. Conflict between nationalities and uh, uh, ethnicities. Conflict between genders. Conflict in the family. Conflict with the neighbors. Conflict in the church. I mean, conflict is our world. And those six words represent the natural way of the unbelieving mind in dealing with conflict. The problem is, is that too often is also the way the believing mind chooses to operate, which causes great detriment to the gospel. You see, the gospel is all about a new way to deal with conflict. While God has every right to condemn us for our transgressions against him, he instead gave his son to take our condemnation so that we could be free through his grace. In like manner, the expectation upon us who have received such grace is that we deal with our conflict according to the grace we have received. Let me back up and say that again. In like manner, as God has shown us, the expectation upon us who have received such grace is that we deal with our conflict according to the grace that we have received. That's why Paul instructs the Ephesian Christians, notice, to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. The worldview of the believing mind does not overlook the transgressions of others committed against us. No, it doesn't do that. But instead of dealing with them according to the ways of the flesh, we deal with them according 
to God's grace. In light of the outrageous debt God has canceled on our behalf because of Christ's sacrifice, we seek Christ-like kindness, tender, forgiving hearts, to be reconciled as opposed to being alienated. The truth point here is another passage of Scripture. So here it is, Luke 12, 48, through the words of Jesus. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Uh, that statement fits a lot of applications, but it certainly fits the life that has had an incalculable debt of sin wiped away by the grace of God through the cross. You, believer, have been given much in grace, in forgiveness, in kindness, in mercy. All designed to unite you with God. To bring you together, not to alienate you, but to bring you to him. And just as he has done that with us, we are to mirror that same mindset and outworking with other people. I remember, this is a long, long, long time ago. It's not the best picture in the world. Maybe from a distance it looks a little clearer than it really is. But that's a picture of our oldest son, David. Many of you don't know David very well, but he's the one who gave us the grandchild recently. And so uh, back in the day when that picture was taken, Connie and I, our marriage was really not that good, to be quite honest. And we were prone to squabble a lot. And in this particular car, and I believe it was the exact same day, we were traveling and we got into an argument and we were fighting and I was angry, and she was angry, and I was saying things that were hurtful, and she was saying things that were hurtful. Now, a little more backstory. During that time, I was in the Air Force. Connie worked at a Christian school, so David got to go to the Christian school for free, right? It was one of the benefits, and so when you go to a Christian school, they usually teach you the Bible, right? And so they were teaching him memory verses, right? And he was about four years old in this, in this picture and at this particular time, and I remember we were just going at it tooth and nail, I mean, I was ready to open the door and kick her butt to the curb. I mean, I was just upset, and she probably felt the same way. If she had a gun, she'd have just pulled out and shot me. <laughs> and right at uh, one of those moments when we both decided to take a breath, when we started, when we got to the place where we had to shut our mouth and take a breath, David pops up out of the back seat just like that, and he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. He said it from memory. I lie not. <laughs> and although he was only four years old and probably really didn't understand what all that meant, nonetheless, he was speaking the worldview of the believing mind. I close with this thought. The gospel is much more than the good news that we can skip hell and gain heaven. It is the reality that God wants to transform us from the image of Adam, that first man who cast the entire human race into judgment and condemnation. He wants to transform us from that to the likeness of his son, who is the perfect, tangible image of God himself. Without Christ, we are under the condemnation of God. In Christ, we have passed from condemnation to perfect love. And I ask you this morning, where are you? Where are you, seriously? Are you without Christ? Are you in Christ? You know, if you sit there and you're not sure, it's highly likely you're outside of Christ. Because when you're in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within you and He bears witness that you belong to Jesus. And so if you don't have that witness and you're trying to figure out, am I really in Christ? Am I not in Christ? I'm not quite sure. It's likely you're probably not. 
And my invitation to you this morning would be this. Would you give me an opportunity to sit down with you and tell you, share with you the gospel? To answer questions? To pray with you? To be used of God to lead you to that place of repentance and faith? That's my invitation. If you, if you have any doubt, that you would respond to that. And whether you respond to it when we're done here or tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday, I don't care. Just as long as you respond. Respond to the ministry of the Spirit of God as He bears witness in your heart that something's not right. Are you in Christ? Many of you are. Well, in that case, I ask you these questions. Are you responding to his transforming work? You know, once he saves you, that's what's his, it's his agenda. His agenda is to bring you up, to mature you, to help you to grow, to help you become more like himself. And he never stops, and he never quits, and everything that comes into your life is all part of that process. Now, He's always at work. We're not always responsive to his work. In fact, many of us can become quite resistant. And we can cook up a whole lot of good reasons why we are resistant. But of course, they're not good reasons. They're just made up stories to cause us to have a little bit better of a conscience. The position of every son and daughter of God is to be responsive to him. When he speaks, you obey. When he prompts, you follow by faith. When he points something out of your life, you say, well, okay, Lord, uh, I can't do this without you. Are you responsive? Are you growing in the likeness of Christ Jesus? Is the worldview of the believing mind becoming the way you see the world? It, it, it grieves my heart to be around some professing believers who when they talk, I know, you know, they're just around a table doing whatever they're doing, and they start talking, and you just, hear the, you just hear them speak the words of the unbelieving mind. They're not unbelieving, but they are speaking like one. Hatred, malice, anger, frustration. Don't like them because of that skin color. Don't like this because of their religious belief. Don't want this. Don't, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blame, 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 blame. It's just like, oh my gosh. If you could just hear yourself. You're speaking with an unbelieving mind. Where, where's grace? Where's, where's love? Where's, where's tender heartedness? Again, I'm not talking about accepting falsehood. We condemn falsehood. Amen? But we love people. And we do what we can, everything we can in the power of the Spirit to, to be a sweet aroma of the life-giving nature of Jesus Christ as opposed to the stench of the world's backbiting and argumentative spirit. What's your worldview? I simply invite you, my brothers and sisters, if you're struggling like I do at times, I'm just encouraging you to allow another believer to come alongside. Share with them your struggle. Nothing helps the church grow closer together in love than to be open and honest with each other and to share the realities of our life and let others in and let them be supportive and helpful. Are you struggling? Let somebody come alongside. Let them encourage you. Let them pray for you. Let me do that. Let my wife do that. Let our elders and deacons do that. Identify the struggle. Work on it together. And by the power of the Spirit of God, overcome the old life because we have the power through the Spirit to walk in newness of life. So, Lord, I pray that you'll take these things that have been shared here this morning and that you'll use them in all of our lives, use them first in my life, in my family's life, 
but in these my church family's life. Help us, O oh God. Help us to clearly see the difference between the old life and the new and the calling that you have made and the power you have provided and the assistance that you constantly give for us to be walking that new path and to become the men and women, boys and girls you've called us to be. Help us to love you greatly. Help us to love one another with an unfailing love, to be patient and kind. Lord, if I've hurt or grieved people in this congregation, may they have the love and tenderheartedness to forgive me because I want to be. And if they have transgressed me, I forgive them just as you have forgiven me. And may we together be one. May we be powerful in this community as your ambassadors. And finally, I pray for that person, those persons that are here who may have a real good dose of religion but have yet to enter into a personal relationship with you, Jesus. Help them to see that. Call their name today. Bring them into your family. Help them to see their need to truly trust you and not to trust in their religion or their good works, but in your good work, through your death on the cross, your resurrection from the dead. May they receive new life, identify that, and may we have the opportunity to help them grow as dearly loved sons and daughters. Thank you for this time to be together. I do want to just offer in quick prayer for those around the world who are suffering right now, who are truly being persecuted for their faith. God, do that supernatural work in them that empowers them to be bold, to be strong, and to see that the light momentary affliction pales in comparison to what you have awaiting them. Deliver them from their enemies Deliver their enemies into their hand to be saved. Lord, help us to remember them as you bring them to our hearts and minds. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife Connie is here. One of our elders, Greg Stearns, is here. I'm here. If you need someone to talk with, pray with, we're available. God bless you. Hope you have a great day.